Welcome to another episode of Ands Up in Conversation. Uh, my name is Dickon Hain. I'm a urologist based in Western Australia, and I'm really pleased to welcome Alison Bertel uh, to join us in conversation today. Alison's a consultant oncologist at the Rosemere Cancer Centre, which is part of the Lancashire Teaching Hospital um, NHS Trust. Um, lovely to see you again, Alison. Welcome. Thank you, Dickon. It's lovely to see you too. Okay, so we're going to be talking about bladder cancer, which is my favourite subject. Um, and in bladder, as we know, with our BUP, our BUP subcommittee, which is bladder and urothelial cancer, as well as penile cancer, but we like to talk about all urothelial cancer. Um, we're, you're particularly well known to us uh, because of the, the PAUT trial and what might follow from the PAUT trial. Um, for those who might be unfamiliar with that study, or maybe you could just start off by just giving us a quick outline of the main findings from that important study. Thanks, Dickon. So PAUT, um, I was uh, privileged to uh, present the uh, the first data analysis uh, back at ASCO GU in 2018. And PAUT was the first randomized trial ever looking at adjuvant therapy versus surveillance in patients that had had a complete resection with a radical nephroureterectomy um, for upper tract urethelial carcinoma, and then had had advanced disease based on that pathological specimen. So it could be T2 to T4 disease. They could be node positive as long as any nodes that were seen macroscopically were removed and then they had a negative post-operative scan um, and um, they were then randomized on a one-to-one -one basis between uh, four cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy or surveillance um, and they had to start that chemotherapy if they were randomized to it within 90 days of surgery. And the reason behind the trial was it was a really unmet need so urologists were often asking me at the MDT will you give this patient adjuvant chemotherapy? And I said, no, there's, there's no data because there wasn't. And so it came from that unmet need. Uh, and also, you know, upper tract urethelial carcinoma, um, even more than, you know, uh, bladder cancer has been neglected for years. There'd been one randomized trial really, which was another UK one, which was um, the Odmit C study looking at a single shot of mitomycin C postoperatively. Um, and that was another UK study from Tim O'Brien. Um, but another otherwise, positive study. another positive study. But the, you know, there were no randomised trials, and everyone said, you know, it would be too difficult to do. It's a niche area. Um, it's it's a difficult randomization between adjuvant treatment and surveillance, and um, there aren't going to be enough centres to be able to recruit to this study. And actually, you know, the, the, the Brits got behind this and um, we had 75 centres across uh, open across the length and breadth of the UK. And um, most of those centres recruited at least one patient. And what happened was we actually stopped the trial early because the Independent Data Monitoring Committee um, said that the data was positive for our primary endpoint point was disease-free survival at three years because that was identified as a key point of interest um, by the trial team when we first set up the study um, and um, we met that at two years um, and we'd be looking for a 15% difference between the two arms but actually the difference was 17% at two years in terms of disease-free survival and that was in favour of the chemotherapy group. Um, the secondary endpoints that we had were quality of life, and we found that that dipped a little um, in the chemotherapy group, as you would expect, at three months, but then returned to normal at 12 months. Um, Metastasis-free survival, which was also positive, with a 15% difference between the two groups at two years. And then overall survival, which wasn't mature enough really to report. Um, we have got an abstract in at the moment for ASCO GU, which with the updated findings from the study, we haven't heard yet. I think when we checked on the website yesterday, it said that if you were successful, participants would be notified before December. So we've got until next Tuesday uh, to hear whether that's been accepted or not. Uh, but obviously it'll be, if it is, it'll be a virtual presentation because of the nature of the world at the moment. So. I was really thrilled with so many things from Pout because, you know, we'd fulfilled an unmet need in a niche patient group with a positive study for the primary endpoint. Um, and that's really now been incorporated into to European guidelines with the European Urology Association guidelines. 
It's, again, fantastic effort um, and, and well done with that study, Alison. Um, so where do you think we can go from here with upper tract um, urothelial cancer? What's, what's the next step? Certainly um, it, with ANZARP, one of the, was, we'll talk about um, later on in the meeting, but one of the issues uh, related to, we don't have an upper tract study that we're running through ANZARP at the moment. What, what are, what are, what's on the cards? Well, we were all ready to go with a successor study, um, which was imaginatively called PALP2. Uh, you know, why break a winning, a winning theme? Um, and, and as you know, Lawrence Kriegler from the ANZAP group was, was leading the, you know, our, our collaboration with you on that. Um, and that was originally the design was, uh, was very simple. It was using chemotherapy as the standard of care um, versus the experimental arm, which was chemotherapy with an IO. And we had got as far as sort of submission to funding bodies for that. But then, um, you know, um, ironically, it's been a very busy time in urothelial cancer with an explosion of new agents um, on the block, some of them targeting certain biomarkers, things like erdofitinib, which is an FGFR, um, uh, uh, sorry, an FGFR receptor antagonist um, um, for certain mutations and fusions. And, um, also, you know, you can't ignore drugs like Enfortimab Vodotin, which has exploded onto the scene. And um, we thought we needed to future proof the study um, and just get the design right. Um, the second thing as well is um, in terms of um, adjuvant bladder cancer, um, the, we've had um, one study that was resoundingly negative looking at adjuvant atezolizumab post cystectomy. Um, and um, I guess that study wasn't powered sufficiently for upper tract disease. What happened with the protocol was um, they were struggling to recruit patients um, with and to start um, adjuvant treatment within 90 days of cystectomy, um, partly down to the protocol and partly down to you know, recovery from surgery. And so they allowed a maximum of 10% of upper tract patients post nephroureterectomy to go into that trial. Um, so the, the upper tract patient that it isn't powered enough to look for a treatment efficacy effect purely for upper tract in that study. But obviously in bladder cancer, it was a negative study for um, adjuvant IOs. Now, you know, urothelial cancer is different in the bladder and in the upper tract. There are far more mutations. There's much more microsatellite instability in upper tract disease. So will we expect there to be a difference with upper tract um, possibly yes, but it was enough for us to, you know, take a take a step back to just rethink the design and also to future proof it because there are so many other agents coming on the scene that we really wanted to look at it. The other data mm. that was made oncologists cry this year was looking at the combination of IO and chemotherapy in first line metastatic urothelial cancer. Um, and, uh, you know, like many people, I, I sort of sat there with bated breath waiting for it to come out because it was the, you know, there were two studies with the, um, the keynote um, uh, study and we had the Invigo 130 and they're both resoundingly negative, which was looking at first line metastatic IO monotherapy or in combination with chemo or with chemotherapy alone. And you know what? Chemotherapy is still the backbone of treatment 20 years on for first line metastatic urothelial carcinoma. So, Alison, what about um, there has been another exciting positive study you, looking at the role of maintenance immune therapeutic agents in patients with advanced urothelial cancer that have responded to chemo. Is this something that you think might have value in the upper tract as well? Oh, um, massively, I think, I think, I, I don't know from the, the actual paper, I don't know what proportion of upper tract uh, patients went into the Javelin 100 study, which is what you're talking about. But remember, that's a different group of patients. These are, so with PAL, we were looking at patients with resectable disease, because one of the problems people often get confused with is downstaging chemotherapy and adjuvant or neoadjuvant. So neoadjuvant treatment is if a patient is pure, is operable already, downstaging is if you're rendering them fit for surgery. Um, in Javelin 100, these were inoperable metastatic patients or metastatic patients. Mm. And they all had um, standard chemotherapy, so either gemcitabine um, with either cisplatin or carboplatin, four to six cycles, and they had to have either stable disease, um, a partial response or a complete response. And then they were randomized on a one-to-one -one basis between either um, surveillance or avelumab. Um, 
and a Bellamab slightly different. It's on a two weekly schedule. And um, and then the, this is a whopping great difference, really. It's a seven month difference in um, survival between the two groups. And when you look at all the subgroups, Dickon, it's the same benefit across all the subgroups. So it was really um, irrespective of type of chemotherapy, um, the all comers population, irrespective of PDL1 status, um, and also whether they had partial response, complete, complete response, or stable disease. The really interesting thing in that study as well is if you look at the, the, the stratified for PDL1 status, actually the PDL1 high group did better with chemotherapy as well as with, with IOs. So, so I think that's what we think now with probably PDL1 positivity. It's probably more a marker of you're going to do better with anything rather than you're going to do a better with a with an IO. But certainly in the I'm UK. Only- in the I'm UK, only, sorry, Dick, go on. No, no, go on. I was just going to make a cynical comment about I'm not sure that the PDA one status is helping us in, in any way. Oh, no, <laughs> no, I agree. Because the other thing with Javelin 100 is they looked at tumor mutational burden, and this was presented at ESMO by Tom Powell's very beautifully. And um, it, it showed us that neither tumor mutational burden nor um, PDA one status were, were, were very good on their own. And it was likely that sort of a combination of the two was, 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 was more interesting because you could have a combination of either of those one way or the other. And, uh, and the, the data looked very similar. Um, but uh, Javelin 100, you know, the maintenance of Elamab in the UK at the moment, we've got an um, early access to medicine scheme. So we can do it at the moment. Um, and it's going to be the subject for our national regulators, the, the purse holders next year, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in, in April of next year. But it's great, isn't it, that there are so many um, new developments in urothelial cancer because for you know people like you and I that are passionate about it, we've had no improvements in survival for such a long time. And this is, okay. this is amazing. I think that's right. And particularly with upper tract TCC, we used to consider nodal metastatic upper tract TCC as incurable disease. Um, yeah. and, and I think interesting, some of the interesting data from, from your PAUT trial is showing how well patients can do even with um, positive disease, especially if they get um, adjuvant chemotherapy. You wonder whether that group of patients might also be the sort of patients who would uh, benefit from IO, those, especially, particularly those with, uh, they've got nodal positive disease, they've likely got other metastatic disease that's unmeasurable. Um, is it is a very as you say there's loads of agents um, available now with so much um, so much to look at so I'm just going to um, move on to bladder cancer proper uh, now if that's all right Alison and um, w- another exciting study was the keynote 57 study um, showing potential uh, benefit from using pembrolizumab in patients with high risk non-mus invasive bladder cancer with CIS um, and indeed the FDA is giving early approval in the states is not available in Australia I'm not sure about the situation in the UK um, it's an area where the urologist has, has always been traditionally responsible for the high-risk non-muscle bladder, non-invasive, uh, high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer space. Um, and I just wondered who you, who do you think uh, should be responsible for the decision about um, immune therapeutic agents in this area? Who should be giving it? Um, any thoughts? Obviously, you're a, a UK oncologist, so you you kind of do you know radiation and uh, chemotherapy. So you're obviously keen to have people trying to hand a few things. What do you think about urologists giving IO? Well, I don't say I'm keen on people having trying their hand because you have to remember I'm accredited and I've done exams in chemotherapy, <laughs> therapies, immunotherapy and radiation oncology. Um, so I don't try my hand at it. I've been qualified and accredited now for a, a lot of years. Um, so um, the first thing to say is immunotherapy, less side effects than chemotherapy for many patients, but a number of patients will get significant and potentially life-threatening side effects that have to be managed promptly and identified. And that's my only concern about people going in gung-ho and giving it who don't appreciate that because um, an example that I'll give you is, um, you know, no matter how much training we do to emergency rooms, primary care physicians, and even colleagues within the hospital in non-oncology areas, you still get patients coming in now who have got, um, particularly in the time of COVID, who've got a cough who are on immunotherapy. And that cough might be COVID, it might be an atypical pneumonia, but equally it might be a pneumonitis. 
and you have to exclude all the other things, but you also have to be thinking, does that patient need steroids now to save them from their progressive pneumonitis, which is autoimmune mediated? Similarly with diarrhea, I've had patients rock up to the emergency room with profound diarrhea, opening their bowels up to 30 times a day, and they've been given some loperamide and sent home for an outpatient endoscopy, whereas they need steroids. And if they, they don't respond to steroids, then they need other immune modulators. Um, so that's my concern because no matter how much we educate patients and they've got the alert cards, no matter how much we try and train colleagues, there is that concern. And um, I still, with, with, with odd side effects from IOs, I still go and talk to, I've got a fantastic colleague called Ruth Board, who's uh, uh, involved in UK melanoma work. And melanoma and renal cell were targets originally, you know, for looking at IOs because chemotherapy was rubbish in those tumor areas. And so the melanoma physicians know far more than any, anybody else in terms of odd side effects for IOs. So if I see something and I think that's a bit weird, not sure about that with a patient on an IO, I'll go and ask my colleague and normally, you know, she'll have a very sensible thought because they'll probably have seen it um, before. But in terms of who should give it, it just needs to be with somebody who's appropriately trained. It's like, you know, you wouldn't, Dick, and I wouldn't be coming and watching you do a cystectomy and then, if, you know, a couple of weeks later thinking, yeah, I'll have a bit of a go at that. It doesn't look well, that hard to me, um, you know. It may, it may not surprise. I'm actually, I'm actually in strong agreement with you, Alison. I don't think, um, I don't think urologists uh, are well positioned to be giving um, immune and surveying patients on these uh, immune therapeutic drugs because of those uh, not frequent, but potentially very serious and life-threatening side effects. So I, I actually agree with you um, on that point. Um, maybe we'll find ways of using different ways of giving IO, which are much safer in the future, which may be more appropriate to, to be delivered by urologists, but we'll see. On, on that point, any, any because we're going to have to um, wrap it up pretty soon, any sort of top picks in the sort of BCG refractory space or the high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer space. As you know, we see a lot of side effects with BCG and we're looking for um, better options. What are your top picks for chemotherapeutic agents, other immune therapeutic agents, or indeed new ideas? So I think I think things like erdafitinib would be quite exciting looking in this space. So remember erdafitinib is an FGFR um, inhibitor. And if you look at the proportion of patients with alterations, mutations, and fusions of the FGFR receptor um, uh, in uh, bladder cancer and in urothelial cancer per se, there's far more in the non-muscle invasive setting than in the muscle invasive setting. Mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously got to be something, you know, to think about that. I'm sure there's going to be some trials coming along with that. Similarly, um, and Fortimab Vidotin, this massive juggernaut, um, as I'll talk about in a, a, a TEDx talk uh, for hands up, um, it is a juggernaut in terms of its efficacy that we've seen so far, this, this new drug that targets Nectin-4 receptors, and that's overexpressed in 90 odd percent of urothelial cancer. So you're not looking for a biomarker, pretty much everybody's got it. So um, I think you know, with any drug, you start off with the advanced setting, you move it earlier and earlier and earlier. And that's, you know, they, they'd be unwise if they weren't going to be looking at that as part of their, their therapeutic area development with the particular drug. Um, so I think there are, you know, there are lots of new combinations looking at different ways of delivery. I know that some industry partners have got different ways of delivering topical cytotoxics um, in development as well. So things, you know, um, almost gadgets that you can put into the bladder that have a sort of a, 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 a supposed to have a more penetrative dose of say gemcitabine given alongside a systemic agent. Um, but I think the big problem for me is going to be capacity because if I've got to look after a whole load of patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, where and how am I going to do that? Because they're going to have to have chair time to deliver the, you know, the systemic agent. Um, in the chemotherapy suite, or if you're going to do it with hospital at home or something like that, you've still got to have capacity. And secondly, um, you need to have my time or that of my, you know, my colleagues. And um, there aren't enough of us, and we've already we're already a bit swamped with, um, you know, new developments in, in prostate cancer, let alone um, trying to manage urothelial cancer. Mm -hmm. Ideally, That's what I'd like to do is, you know, train up a lot of our advanced nurse practitioners and uh, prescribers so that you know we were oncology is a very 
inclusive area where you know we work with with consultant radiographers we work with consultant nurses we work with prescribing pharmacists and being able to sort of hand over some of the the oral work you know to other colleagues and you know I, I think we just need to train up um people who are already working within oncology to be able to to to, to work safely it's like my io systemically I don't review those every time myself. My advanced nurse practitioner will review them sort of one cycle, then I'll review them the next cycle. But obviously, if there's any problems, she'll come and talk to me. But she's from a chemotherapy background. Sure. That's no, that's that's interesting insights. Um, so I suppose um, in, in, in terms of the IO space, something that that was less toxic than BCG, an immune therapeutic drug that was less toxic, but more effective, could still perhaps be delivered um, more easily by the urologists or more, more easily outside of um, chemotherapy suites would be attractive to everyone. Um, I think so. I think pa patients hate BCG. If you go onto any of the patient forums, so I'm lucky enough to work with Fight Bladder Cancer in the UK, um, who work with Bladder Cancer Australia. And, um, and, and if you go onto the closed forums, they, you know, patients really suffer with BCG, but they don't tell us because they're terrified it's going to be stopped. But it's yeah. a horrible, nasty, toxic drug that makes their bladder shrink and their quality of life's rubbish. It's a, it's a very toxic therapy. And hopefully one of the, um, when we've finished recruiting to the BCG mitomycin trial that we're running, running through ANZA, mm -hmm. we'll actually have a, um, regardless of the outcome of the trial, we'll have a lot of very rich data about the actual, um, the, the, the toxicity and the tolerability of, of, of BCG in a, in a very large prospectively collected fashion, which doesn't really exist um, very clearly in the literature currently. So um, that's something to, to, which will be interesting regardless of the outcome of that study. Um, well, I, I think we're probably um, out of time, Alison. Look, it's been fantastic to talk to you um, and, and lovely to have you joining ANZ up once again. Um, it's uh, a any, pleasure. Any, any closing comment or something? I always have to give you the last word. Do you know, I just think it's lovely that we, you know, we, we've got the technology that we can manage to do something like this, um, allowing for glitches here and there. And I think, um, you know, it, it, Australia and New Zealand are now no longer quite so far away. Um, and I'm sure that, um, you know, we need to carry on strengthening um, our collaboration with clinical studies. One thing that I have learned as well is that remote consent is possible um, to do remote consent, both for radiation and for systemic therapies. And we need to be able to make trial protocols such that we can you know, incorporate remote consent into that as well. And that way we'll be able to collaborate a lot more effectively when, when we look at our combined you know, UK and ANZUP studies. That's, that's great. Thank, thanks very much, Alison. You're so welcome. Take care.